Good morning. And welcome to all of you on behalf of Tidewater Community College and its four campuses serving nearly 45,000 Hampton Roads residents. A hearty welcome to all of you. We're especially pleased that you're joining us in the TCC Roper Theater, a beautifully restored 1926 Lowe's State Theater. I'm also pleased to welcome you to our Norfolk campus, where annually we serve over 13,000 Norfolk residents in degrees and certificate programs, half of whom transfer successfully to universities right here in the Hampton Roads or in Virginia. The other half of graduates enters the local workforce in the region's primary industries in entry and middle skilled jobs. Through our partnerships with the local school divisions and especially under public law 1184, the mandated memoranda between community colleges and local school divisions to provide college credits to students through dual enrollment will further strengthen the ability of local residents to obtain college certifications that will set them on a path of prosperity and economic viability. And it is for these reasons that we also welcome my colleague, Dr. Samuel King, to Norfolk, and we look forward to strengthening the partnership with the Norfolk School Division. Dr. King took the helm as superintendent of Norfolk Public School in July 2012, the same week when I took the helm of TCC. He came to Norfolk from Rockdale County Public Schools in Georgia, where he was named Georgia State Superintendent of the Year 2011. He is a native of Smithville, Georgia. He attended Mercer University, where he earned a Bachelor's of Arts degree in middle grades education. He then earned a Master's degree and Specialist degree in Education Administration and Supervision from the University of West Georgia. He received his Doctorate in Educational Leadership from the University of Sarasota. He began his career in public education 30 years ago as a classroom teacher of mathematics and science, and he taught the high school, middle, and elementary levels before moving into administration. He is entering his ninth year as a superintendent. Since he arrived in Norfolk, he has focused on developing a five-year strategic plan for Norfolk Public Schools, building alliances in our community, and putting the students at the center of all decision making. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce Dr. Samuel King. I too would like to take the opportunity to say, to say good morning to each of you and welcome. It is truly a significant opportunity to 
speak to you in reference to our public school system. For as you reflect upon the video, it without doubt pinpoints the fact that our approximately 32,000 plus students represent our greatest resource, the nation's greatest resource. Thus, the importance of investment. However, it is much more multifaceted than that. And that is what I would like to pinpoint this morning so that we can have clarity around who we are, where we are, what we represent, in addition to our direction. So, with that said, I applaud TCC for uh, allowing us to, to be here to speak to this audience of stakeholders, as well as the support of Old Dominion, as well as the support of the Chamber, and uh, the significance, the vital significance of that entity for our work. And I also applaud the city for its involvement and welcome Mayor, Mayor Frame with us, as well as any other councilmen, council people represented here along the way. So major stakeholders. So who are we? Where are we? What represents our mission? As you heard, I have served public education for approximately 30 years now. And in my view, after serving 30 years, it certainly must be a calling. And out of those 30 years, I have spent now my ninth year as a superintendent. So truly a calling in reference to the importance of educating our young to be college and career ready. Very challenging task, very challenging quest. However, the previous school year, we realized upon doing an internal and external analyses, which consisted of a cross-section of stakeholders, we quickly revealed that we needed to lay out and map out an immediate blueprint before the system did not have in place a five-year strategic plan. Again, approximately 32,000 plus students, uh, more than 5,500 employees, very complex organization. Any chief executive officer that is going to lead and guide and facilitate uh, a high degree of performance must have direction, must have vision, must have those things in place that will allow you to be aspirational. During the year, we had the opportunity very briefly, I want to take a path and for some of you, introduce uh, the tenets of, of our travels the first year, my first year, I've just completed my first year here as superintendent. But so I want to uh, refresh that path for some, but introduce that path to others. Because as we began to do that work, we knew that it was important to involve and engage the stakeholders. Uh, we formed a team of approximately 30 individuals, a cross-section of the community, made up of parents, business owners, faith-based, clergy, law enforcement, healthcare, uh, post-secondary, etc. Of course, the internal audience consisting of teachers, principals, all of the above, uh, invitations to the city, et cetera, to be able to do the work, to talk about the strengths, the weaknesses, opportunities that are before us, and threats that could come into play as we begin to move forward with implementation of very cutting edge, challenging action plans and action steps. Before you, you see a result of what that major planning team developed as the new Norfolk Public Schools 
mission. I draw your attention to the wording that pinpoints the fact that that group said to us that we must have the purpose as a school system of ensuring that all students maximize their academic potential, maximize their academic potential. So a two-part mission, non-negotiable and a no-brainer in terms of the academic piece, but as important, you see the soft skill emphasis and the career readiness piece followed. So in addition to maximizing potential as it relates to the academia, it is also our mission to begin to develop skills for lifelong learning and have students to begin to internalize that information so that they can be successful in society, so that they can compete in a global society. We all know the research, especially here recently over the past five years or so with the economic downturn and the fact that unemployment was at its highest in some cases. But the research centered on the fact that jobs went unfilled. And the reason for that centered on college and career readiness specifically the soft skills that were necessary for students, youngsters, who had exited high school, maybe entered college, but wanted to enter the workforce, but lacked the skills such as the ability to communicate in verbal and written form, the ability to work in a group, group dynamics, the, the ability to co-mingle, the ability to work from a project-based standpoint to accomplish a mission. In my view, thus the reason our planning team developed and pinpointed our purpose, as you see it on the screen. You also know that strategic planning is no easy task, not if you're going to be true to it. It should also be aspirational. Therefore, the group was required to reach agreement, not consensus, over a period of days, over a period of extensive hours, people from all walks of life coming together to talk about the work. And when you consider the whole notion of, of, of aspiration and determining the aspiration for our organization, it is a simplistic approach or thought to describe it as the opportunity to, to take a look into the future and determine the highest aspiration for our organization, which for us is the school system, and simply begin to develop strategies to take us there. Therefore, you see before you in bold print the vision, the phraseology around the vision that our microcosm of this community developed. And it states that our school system should be, should become, should strive to become the cornerstone of a proudly diverse community. Those of you that have been well immersed in strategic planning also know that when you pinpoint a vision, once you develop that vision and you read it, it should say something to you instantly. That is, once you read it, once you internalize it, you should quickly realize we're not there. If that is not your response, then it truly isn't visionary. But that group said to us that we are not the cornerstone today of a proudly diverse community. We must strive over the next five years as we implement the strategic plan, as it will be, to become that. So our work is huge. And I'd like to, as I take you through those uh, travels, bring us current and profile 
what we now consider the status quo. So that it is very clear the work that we have before us. But as I do so, recognize the diligent efforts that building level leaders, employees, board members, community members have all employed to begin the work, the motivation behind doing so. This mission vision statement also includes the means that are bulleted for carrying out the process. I won't read those to you because you can log on to our website on the home page, link to the strategic plan, and find this information and go deeper into the multiple action plans and action steps. And I'll talk a little bit about, more about that shortly. That team also had the responsibility of developing community beliefs. In other words, when that group of stakeholders came together, questions were, and, and poured over statistics related to our school system, that group, again, had the challenge of reaching agreement around what our community beliefs should be around public education specific to North Norfolk City Schools. On the screen, you see a sampling of those. And I want you to take an opportunity to eyeball those because there are very significant themes and common threads that run through each of those. From the necessity of having respect for each individual, definitely students, certainly our customers as parents, definitely our, our employees, and inclusive of other stakeholders that we, that, that we determine external. In addition, what do, we, what do we understand and believe about learning? Do we truly believe that each child can learn? That's easy to say, but where is the action that really pinpoints that? Where is the action that aligns with the fact that we believe that each child can learn and move forward from where he or she is? Also, the family, a critical piece in our work, a critical piece in our work. And coming to the realization that in order to engage families, then we're going to have to not just invite families into our schools, but we're going to have to go out into the communities and engage our families and parents, whether it's through the church, whether it's through recreational leagues, whether it's through homeowners association, whatever it takes. Believing that every child deserves a high quality education is a no brainer, should be. And our actions should always reflect that. Also, as that group continued to do its work, it developed, I believe, 11, 11 beliefs, community beliefs around public education. You have a chance to eyeball those four. I won't read those to you. Common threads running through those as well. Centering on leadership. Centering on the fact that we must have great principles. And we must support great principles. We must help to develop those great principles. We must have more than simply highly qualified teachers in the classroom. We must have highly effective teachers in the classroom. The difference in my view is that a, that a highly effective teacher gets results. And we talk about results, we mean increasing the percentage of students that meet and exceed standards. But that's about professional learning. That's about the development that you offer to your people as you move forward. Valuing that process, of course, is very important. And it goes without a saying that if we are truly going to be a partner in the process of our city evolving to the, to the level that we know it can, 
we will become that cornerstone of a proudly diverse community. And as we do so, it allows the whole mission and purpose of the city to accelerate. Because education is the lifeblood of a community. And if education is the lifeblood of a community to attract and retain industry, schools must be strong. We must build great schools. If you, as you take a look at those three bullets around community beliefs as well, it speaks to the relationships that must be built. You're going to hear us talk a lot about rigor, relevance, and relationships as it relates to children. We must bring rigor before each child to move them forward. We must challenge them, challenge them to grow and prosper. The curriculum that we roll out and implement must be relevant, meaning it must prepare them for the next level, and it must prepare them for the college and career readiness piece. So relevance is truly important. However, the relationship piece is also important. And in my view, it is the most important out of the three. And I will reiterate that shortly as you take a look at the statistics for our student population. Because the research is very clear around the importance of building relationships with students when you have certain demographics and socioeconomics and variables that come into play, all of those things should surface in your strategic plan. Safety and security in our buildings, of course, of utmost importance because you cannot meet the elements of the standard if children don't feel safe. In addition, you will have strong difficulty, we will have strong difficulty with meeting the elements of the standard if our employees and our staff, if they do not feel safe. So that is our work to continue. That group also imposed certain parameters for doing our work, which means that we should be held accountable for implementation going forward with our strategic plan. The community should be held accountable for implementation as well as a partner in its own role. These are the things that the group said to us that must not be violated as we continue to plan and as we continue to implement. That does not mean that tomorrow, today, or yesterday, we're perfect because there is no panacea in this process, because this is a process of evolving. That's why you build strategies to move in the direction that we should. So we must become better and better with doing the work. And you see the parameters. These are the things that we should be committed around as we move forward. Measurements. I will click quickly as I uh, accelerate this whole process a little bit, I will quickly draw your, your attention to the term all. I remember the discussions, the extensive discussions throughout this process last year, as we spent the year building this plan, where stakeholders kind of debated around, you know, we're starting at a certain baseline. We have much work to do. Should we begin with 80% as our goal? Because that certainly would be improvement. Uh, should we move to 85? Or should, we, should it be 90%? But that, remember the group was required to secure agreement, not consensus. So at the end of the day, the group said, this is a strategic plan. We must plan to be successful with all. And when we fall short with being successful with all, then we adjust and modify our strategies so that we increase the intensity for the student that we missed so that we're able to move forward. And I, I applaud 
that level of thinking. The culminating piece for that group was the development of five strategies, and those strategies are before you. These are the, are the five strategies that will lead and guide our work for the next five years. That means that beneath each strategy, if you log on to our website, you will find multiple action plans and action steps to meet those strategies. At this point, it is an approximate 200-page document. It has been phased as it relates to year one, because we're in phase one, year one of implementation. And so you will be able to pinpoint those items of importance for implementation for this current year. Again, multiple action plans and action steps beneath each of these five strategies. The first one speaks to the system becoming that cornerstone of the community's well-being to support the work of all. Secondly, the family, the community, the partnerships. Thus, in my view, the reason that it is important to stand and talk about the current state of things. So, that each and every stakeholder can determine where they can contribute. Because we do know that over the years, five to 10 years back, if you quantify the numbers of students that we had in our school system, we know that we've lost students each year in the tune of a couple of hundred each year. And if we were to quantify that today, while we have in excess of 32,000 students, if we were at a level where we were retaining those students in our system, we would be a system of over 50,000 children. Thus, the discussion centered on how do you attract back those families? How do you regain the trust of families? How do you change the perception of this system to the point that we respect choice? Some will choose private, some will choose home school, some will choose to move to Virginia Beach or Chesapeake, but we don't want it to be because of the quality of education that we offer. So how do you begin to change that work? Very, very powerful discussions. Relentlessly pursue engaged learning through high quality instruction. Speaks to effectiveness, speaks to professional learning. Host environments in which all individuals feel safe and secure. We alluded to that a little bit earlier. Nurture a culture of excellence, equity, and justice through continuous improvement. Again, in my view, that means become culturally competent, culturally proficient. And that's not just ethnicity. That's also about the socioeconomic piece. That's also about demographics. That's also about modalities. That's also about how we educate a child based on the way that they learn. So very important for us, but a work in progress, of course. So where are we now? We have begun implementation. We do have a five-year strategic plan now. We are in year one, phase one. We started implementation in the month of August. Action plans and action steps have indicators and measures that should be quantifiable. And so we can quantify progress or it can be pinpointed in a qualitative manner. So indicators that we're able to report to our board now quarterly things that we were not able to do last year without a five-year strategic plan that related to the relevance of the needs of children. And data in terms of statistics, important statistics being the driver of this entire process. We do know, as we, of course, were required to, through scientifically-based research and best practices, as we had begun to do this work, 
that we had to slice and dice all of the variables around our student community, our families, our stakeholders to determine what are the symptoms of our issues, not just the symptoms, but what are the root causes so that we can begin to build the strategies to address those root causes so that we can see them eliminated. So who are we? In, in a disaggregated sense, with approximately 32,000 plus students, when we begin to disaggregate the data, we disaggregate the, the, the data across multiple subgroups. And as we disaggregate the data across multiple subgroups, we begin in the aggregate. And so what it, we then find that there are socioeconomic indicators serving as variables of importance for our work, not as an excuse for our work, but as an indicator that we must utilize as we plan. So if you take a look at this, you know then that in the aggregate with the uh, over 32,000 students, you know that approximately 71% of our children come to us from economically disadvantaged households. Again, that's a variable. However, it is a variable that we must own and understand. Why, you might ask? Because it impacts the work that must be done. It is very clear that this has implications for the readiness level of children when they enter the doors. For example, we can simplify it by considering the fact that children should be read to each day. When you have an economic disadvantage variable, you cannot assume that that is happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Not because we have bad families, not because we have bad guardians, none of the above, but many times people are working two jobs. Many times children may be latchkey. Therefore, they're not at the dinner table, table having the conversations about how school might have gone today. And from an early learning standpoint, Maybe, just maybe, they heard 50% of the vocabulary words that they should have heard prior to entering as four-year-olds or prior to entering the kindergarten ranks. And if they heard only 50% of the vocabulary words that they should have, then they enter the doors behind. They enter the doors with gaps. I only mention this because this is a phenomenon that must surface in our strategic plan in order to begin to do the work the way that we must do the work. Make the paradigm shift. Own the profile. Know the status quo and begin to develop the strategies necessary to close that gap that already exists even prior to the students entering school and embrace the child where he or she is, develop the safety nets appropriate to begin to move them forward. That's why that's important. So that speaks to safety nets. But at the same time, enrichment is extremely important because as we begin to implement the strategies to, to close and eliminate those gaps, we must also provide the enrichment that's necessary for children that are already on standard and exceeding standard because they are there in the aggregate as well. We refer to that as raising the floor and the ceiling simultaneously. But we're going to show you in a few minutes that with the gaps, we must accelerate the rate at which we raise the floor continue to enrich children to take them to the next level. But if we're going to close the gaps and eliminate the gaps, we must own the necessity to accelerate the rate at which we raise the floor simultaneously. 
So you see here 71% economic disadvantage, and if you ask, you know, well, how do you determine that? It's based on qualifying for free or reduced lunch. And so it's tied to the household income. The household income determines whether you qualify for free or reduced lunch or whether you qualify as economically disadvantaged. I don't know your thoughts, but my thoughts still center on the fact that education still determines income for the most part. And if that is the case, then this has implications for educational levels in the households and parenting skills that we also must offer as we entice and engage families and invite them back into the schools. We must also provide parenting centers to pinpoint the importance of phonemic awareness of a print-rich environment, of that vocabulary phenomena that I mentioned earlier. So, and then you look at the fact that the African-American population makes up approximately 19 plus thousand students, and 84% within that subgroup comes to us from economically disadvantaged households. You also see that Across our white student subgroup, we have approximately 7,000 students. Approximately 40% of those students come to us from economically disadvantaged households. You see that we also have a Hispanic population consisting of approximately a little bit over two, approaching 3,000 students, and about 69-70% from economically disadvantaged households within that subgroup. Multiracial subgroup, approximately 2,000 students, they're about with 61% of those students coming to us from economically disadvantaged households. Last subgroup, major subgroup, Asian students, we have approximately 700 plus students, 50% of those students coming to us from economically disadvantaged households. Again, a variable that we must realize, but plan accordingly, and it has implications for the fact that we must partner with all of the entities out there to deliver these services and at the same time provide the enrichment for those students that do not need the safety nets. You don't overlook the fact that we need to raise the ceiling for those children that have those necessities. But when you're at that 71% range, you must partner with the entities that are out there from a mental health standpoint, the nutrition uh, implications, the health care implications, because if we, if we have hung, hungry children in the seats, we could have the very best strategic plan possible, but children won't learn. If we have children that are sick in the seats, we could have a very best strategic plan possible and the, and the very best implementation, but children won't learn. Therefore, all of these things must surface in our strategic plan. At this point, we have 27 schools that are accredited with warning. We have 15 that are fully accredited, and we have three that are accreditation denied. So what does that mean? That means that those are variables and statistics that are tied to the percentage of students meeting and exceeding standards. So simply put, we must increase the percentage of children that meet and exceed standards across all subgroups, all subgroups that you saw mentioned. It goes without saying, we know that the rigor in the assessment changed, and that started around 09, thereabout, with math, with ramping up the curriculum, with reading, with writing, the whole language piece, and with science, which means that the curriculum changed to become more rigorous, the assessments changed to become more rigorous. There was a three-year process to introduce all of those things. When those things happen, then central level must modify its approach and change its curriculum internally, change its scope and sequence, change its pacing guide, and modify its standards to meet the change in the rigor of the assessments. 
So they, those are things that uh, should have begun back in 09 and even prior to. So what did our state superintendent say about that? You see that this is designed to make our children better prepared, but they are only better prepared when they meet and master those standards. Therefore, the way that we do the business of school must change. And it must change in a differentiated manner. So what are the imperatives? There are five bullets before you. We have the strategic plan in place. It's transparent. It's there for all eyes to see, parents, students, other stakeholders. We must implement with fidelity. As we report quarterly to the board around the items of importance, they must be measured incrementally. In many cases, we're starting lower than we would like to. So our baselines are lower. And if our baselines are low, we know we're not going to move to the absolute overnight. However, if we're not going to move to the absolute overnight, we must be committed to a challenging level of growth. What are those indicators? How is it quantified? How much progress are we making from a formative standpoint? Are we measuring those? We must decrease the percentage of children that struggle. We must increase the percentage of students that exceed the standards. No brainer based on what I described. That means we have to have the necessary enrichment for those students that prosper. We must have the necessary safety nets for those students that struggle, move them from the struggling ranks to on standard to exceeding so that we see the exceeding grow. Again, you heard me mention raising the floor and the ceiling simultaneously. So you get that. So we talked about the aggregate and disaggregating the data across the economic disadvantage phenomena and what that means as far as readiness for children when they come to us, sometimes as little ones, but sometimes transferring in. And so when we realize that those gaps are present, then within our strategic plan, we should have the items that are necessary that require that we give the professional learning to adults in the building and central office to defy the norm. It has been done. There are best practices out there around doing so, and that's what we will do. But this, this defines it. If you take a look at this, you see that in red, that pinpoints the performance of our economically disadvantaged students at the, at the elementary level. In blue, it pinpoints the performance of our students that are not economically disadvantaged. There's huge room for growth across the board. But if we're truly going to begin to move the needle, we're going to begin to close the gap in a way that when it's closing, it's closing and the top level is also rising. You saw the numbers, the percentages, the proportions of children that are in the red. Remember I said 71% of our families come to us from economically disadvantaged households, and then you see where economically disadvantaged students perform at the elementary level. Actually, that's middle. Elementary, middle, high, high school. So the gap on the average is around 20 to 30%. So we know what the answer is. We know what we must do. So the reality, schools that are challenged with large percentages of students that are not meeting standards will remain in that cycle, that cycle of challenge 
if we do not intervene in the way that we alluded to earlier, but in a customized manner based on the needs of individual children tied to the deficient standards, not a cookie cutter approach. So if Sam King needs probability and statistics and I mastered all of the other standards, then that my safety net should relate to probability and statistics. Not all of those other things that I already mastered. So it's a fluid approach, complicated, but very logical. And if we do not intervene and differentiate at that level, then it simply means that we think that equal is equitable. And it is not. Because what one school needs in terms of services to move student achievement forward is not the same thing that's needed in another school. It's different but the same high level service and support for all, very important. Of course, you've heard a lot about a recommendation that we've discussed about transformation. 10 schools that are pinpointed that can benefit from great support and resources to begin to move student achievement forward in a way that it starts a process of reinventing the school, bringing in rigor, and resources and theme thematic support that schools have never had before in phase one. And it also, in addition to those 10 schools, it also includes the recommendation for an open campus high school. Well, we experienced some sense of success with moving forward with uh, graduation rate moved forward from 77, I think, to about 78% this time with on-time graduation. But that's not enough, and we all know that. But we celebrate the positives. We also had a school that moved out of a certain status to another status at the middle school level as well. Very positive, we celebrate that, but that's not enough. And when you think about an open campus concept, we know that we have students in middle school that the system refers to as over age for grade, meaning that they're 16 years of age and older and they're still in middle school. That has to change. And at this point, the system has had no options, no non-traditional options for children like that. This will allow us to remove those students and develop individual plans for them with the same curriculum, the same rigor, but customize that approach for them to get them back on track so that they can graduate on time. One item of importance. Second item of importance centers on the fact that we have children on all five of our high school cam campuses that are behind on credits to the point that mathematically they couldn't graduate from high school, not on time. If that's not even, not even taking credit recovery that we offer now day to day, today. So what are our options for those children? Thus, the importance of open campus to begin to customize that approach to get them back on track. It does not change the curriculum. It's the same curriculum, the same rigor, but it customizes it to the point that we move them at their own pace. We change the one-on-one -on -one process, and it is the best practice in urban systems that has been done with systems that have our variables and needs. So we know we need more time because children are behind. And if children are behind, we need additional days to prepare them for the summative assessment. So that's an issue for us, time to provide safety nets. We want fall intercessions. We want uh, winter intercessions. Of course, we need summer intercessions to bring children back that have struggled so that we can give them that intense service laser-like. And we also need to bring back those children that need the enrichment because they're the high flyers. Those are things that are important for us. Flexible master schedules, modified seat time, all things that are important throughout our schools. Professional development, we talked about that. The calendar has implications for the time piece that I mentioned. Professional development for 
our, our classroom teachers and building level leaders as well as central level and being able to attract and retain the very best. But time is also money. So we want access to every funding stream that is available out there, whether it's at the federal level, or whether it's at the state level or local level to be able to do things such as pay stipends to our teachers to be able to come back during intercessions to offer these services or offer transportation for children that we need to secure from their home environment to bring back to school for these intercessions. Curriculum doesn't change. The themes such as NASA partnerships, STEM, AVID, Montessori strategies, pre-IB, IB, across elementary, middle, into high school, are all themes that enhance the process of moving children forward and bringing the rigor to them at the same time and transforming the school and perception of the school. So curriculum alignment, we must teach based on what the state requires, aligned with the SOL. I mentioned literacy. Simply put, our children must read on grade level and above by the end of third grade. Then a lot of the challenges that you've heard me mention this morning, those challenges begin to minimize. Differentiated instruction, the rigor, cycle for results, very important, something that we should see manifest itself throughout each of our schools, 100% required in the strategic plan to the point that we are to ensure that we are teaching aligned with the requirements of the state curriculum. As we teach, we measure the amount of learning that's taking place. Are children mastering? Are they excelling? If children are, if children are struggling, where is the evidence of the safety net aligned to the deficient standard? If children excel, where is the evidence of enrichment aligned to the necessities? And where is the evidence after the safety net and enrichment takes place that children have moved forward and they're ready to, to master further? And you repeat that cycle. So you hear me, you've heard me mention safety nets. You've heard me mention enrichment throughout. And we'll give you just a snapshot of what safety nets what a safety net program can look like uh, from a school standpoint, because it can appear in an individual classroom, it can appear throughout a school, or it can appear across a grade level. Summer school isn't something students normally look forward to, but at PB Young Senior Elementary School, students are eager and excited to be in class. This non-traditional pilot program brings in students daily from pre-K to fifth grade for hands-on fun instruction and special enrichment activities. This program you're going to see active learning, children in gardens, children are painting, children are up moving, singing all day. We aren't really constrained with the curriculum of a time frame. I can only do this activity for 15 minutes because then I need to transition to math. We're going into the Montessori Charter, which therefore it's all meeting students where they are based on where they are developmentally. So we're just allowing teachers to teach where students' needs need to be met. The school focuses on creative instruction in the mornings, followed by enrichment activities that students themselves have chosen. These activities include everything from tennis and flag football to dancing and computer lab time. On Fridays, the students receive no classroom instruction. Instead, they go on field trips or participate in special activities at the school. These Friday fun days are earned by students' good behavior throughout the week. We want these children to understand that they have earned their Fridays. And Fridays are field trips, they're sports tournaments, they're show and tells where they're going to build some lemonade stands and things. But kids have to earn their Fridays. And they do it by good behavior and showing up every day and being here on time. Community partners have played a huge role in this summer school even existing. The United Way of Southampton Roads found a sponsor for the entire program, Dollar Tree, and has worked with the school every step of the way. Many other local partners have also stepped up by contributing time and resources in order to help these young people have bright futures. Many of the students lack uh, the support that they need uh, throughout the year academically and in, in other areas as well. 
And we believe that if we make an investment in these children, we believe that we are providing for them a foundation uh, for success, particularly in the area of literacy. This is why we believe the summer program is so important. This eight-week program, which runs from June 24 through August 16, is clearly designed to prevent summer slippage in students. But more importantly, it makes them enthusiastic about learning. The students are very excited, they're engaged in their learning, and they're excited about sharing all that they've learned. They're ready to come back and review all the skills, saying, hey, I, I like this activity, can we do this again? So they're owning their learning and wanting to create more activities to go along with the skills that have been taught throughout the school year. All the students are excited. I see them coming in, um, particularly the younger ones. You know, they're learning, they're growing, they're being challenged. And it's not only academic. I think it's going to be a win for, win for the teachers, for the students, for the administrators, for the city. The key for this type of safety net is that it's focused during the summer, about 300 children for eight weeks with partnerships with United Way, supported by Dollar Tree, supported by other entities, of course, you know, supported by the city, et cetera, is an example of what is going to be required for us to begin to move the whole process forward to close and eliminate gaps. However, it has to be focused on the needs of children. And this had the academic emphasis infused within it around what are the deficiencies that children display that they did not master during the regular school year. A diagnostic early and then a post afterwards to see how much growth took place aligned to standards. So that the whole brain drain notice is minimized and children enter school more prepared to learn going into that next school year. At the same time, enrichment is extremely important around children that excel. And so at this, as we do enter into the safety net approach with intercessions, et cetera, we should also embrace ramping up enrichment that's necessary, having more children ready to enter cutting edge programs that allow children to prosper. Oh, great, great, very, very rigorous and uh, very knowledgeable. A lot of problem solving, uh, a lot of group dynamics, uh, also traits of leadership amongst the groups. And so a lot of those soft skills that you want students to really internalize as they do what they do. So, I mean, good stuff. I'm delighted that he had the opportunity to come and see our kids in the cadaver lab, in the anatomy lab, and then here in the MDL as well. Um, it's an extraordinary opportunity for the kids to come over here every single day. And the natural partnership just due because of the proximity of Maury High School to EVMS makes for a natural community partnering. Oh, they, do, they do wonderfully. They're so excited. You can see them today. They're all working as a team, uh, learning from each other, and uh, really modeling the way that healthcare is delivered today and will be delivered in the future. It's really interesting and I feel um, really happy that uh, um, we're like 0.01% of all high school students who get to um, participate in any type of program like this. So, you know, none of the other high schools are able to take forensic science um, with an actual hands-on application. And um, it's kind of nice to work from other things than worksheets. So seeing more and more students prepared to go into cutting edge programs such as that means that we have to start at the early learning range moving children from zero to five, prepared to enter the, the kindergarten ranks, to read on grade level and above by the end of third grade, move into middle school ready, move into high school with choices. And so ultimately, that's what we want to see in our five-year strategic plan. So community engagement is required in order to do this. And so I urge you to visit and take a look at the strategic plan to determine how you can support the effort. I urge you to consider engaging, as you see here with the state and local leaders, about supporting pre-K, early learning. Because for us, that's where the rubber meets the road. We need, to, we need to partner with our early learning entities, zero to five, to ensure that children are getting what they need 
to be ready to enter school so that we don't spend the kind of money that we have to spend now for safety nets. Because as we do that work and see children reading on grade level and above by the end of third grade, then it reduces the necessity for safety nets throughout. And of course, Norfolk Education Foundation is in place to support that whole effort to give stipends and scholarships to classrooms for doing innovative kinds of things that align with the strategic plan. So that's very important for us as well. And I'll close with this. The pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity. That's easy to do. The optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. Again, our children are our greatest resource. And if nothing else, we owe it to them. So thank you for your time and your attention. Dr. King, the first question is, how is the school division working with city and state leaders to increase support for public education in Norfolk? Well, I believe we are working to, uh, from a state of evolving, to get better and better each day locally. Um, we are forming partnerships with the city. We're having ongoing discussions around the necessities um, tied to our strategic plan. Now that we have a strategic plan, we're able to present to the mayor and council around these needs to align our budgeting with that process. So it's more of a laser-like focus on what the needs of our children really center on. And the members of my staff, administrative team, also serve on um, committees for the city as well. We are working with local legislators and having the discussion or discussions around advocating for public education because we have to do that as well. Uh, we have board members that are participating and uh, having open dialogue with the local legislators around what that means. We're also having discussions with the local legislative body around flexibility. And what's unique and different about Norfolk? Because the things that we need compared to systems in the surrounding region are different. And we have to do that work differently. If one or more of the transformation schools does not succeed under the new model, will we be able to change their model for the following school year? How would that affect the students and the staff? Well, that's an if that I don't see because the model is around the cutting edge thematic that ties to student achievement, which means daily you measure the amount of learning that takes place in the classroom. Montessori strategies, STEM, pre-IB, IB, all of those things are things that enhance the process to help children be ready after middle school to enter or make a choice by high school as to whether they want to take advantage of some other choices. So it's not an issue of success because implementation with fidelity, utilizing the cycle for results, which is what we are about, done at the level that it should guarantees success, and success means increases in student achievement. I think a better question would be a choice of a theme in terms of if I'm not interested in pre-IB or IB or Montessori strategies, then what does that mean? Because we're not changing the SOL approach. That continues. This is a, an enhancement of that. This is ramping that up. So the question really, in my view, centers on what if the parent decides that they're not interested in that theme? Then we ought to build in the opportunity to make choices 
on an incremental basis. Okay, well, the next question is still along the lines of the transformation initiative. It says each transformation school will have an advisory council made up of the community members. What kind of impact can those groups have on the operations of a school? It's a good question. I like to call it a management council, management team. So what it is designed to do, let me, let me preface this by saying we have community stakeholders that have volunteered to be a part of a focus group to talk about the management team piece. But there are parameters around the management team. And I can name some of those. I can give you examples of what typical management teams, typically what they do and what they look like. Those management teams consist of, of course, a principal, of course, teacher representatives, of course, uh, business representatives from the community or anyone who's supporting the school in any way and invested in the school. So a, a cross-section of individuals. But the purpose of that management team is to continuously review the site-based plan to look at the progress that's being made with the implementation of the site-based plan to enter into dialogue around, OK, these things are positive. We did not secure the amount of growth over the past four weeks that we wanted here. What are we going to do different? So it gives you another platform for support and engagement. And somewhere we, we, we mention a community engagement. It, it forces community engagement. And so that's what's exciting about it for me. However, remember, the involvement of that community committee will help drive that process. But many times, that management team discusses anything from dress code, for example or anything from uh, formative assessments, how often should we do that in, these school, in this school, how is it important for us, and what's the routine for doing common formative assessments, how often should we do those. And so having open dialogue for that and giving more support to the school. Okay, and this is the last one dealing with the Transformation Initiative. I guess folks who were really interested in that. Right. And it says the Transformation Initiative calls for parents to sign a contract in which they agree to volunteer in the schools. How will that be implemented, monitored, and enforced? Okay, good question. You know that in the No Child Left Behind legislation, there was nothing that related to accountability for parents. And we know that. It was all about accountability for schools and accountability for school systems. And so if you saw the tenets of the strategic plan, then you realize that for us it's important that we engage parents. Well, and you also realize that based on the socioeconomic um, variables, that we have a need to build strong families that can support the children. And so by requiring that those documents are signed and supported, says to a parent that here are the things that I'm going to commit to do, whether it's vol volunteering for X amount of time per month, whether it's coming into our parenting centers to hear examples of cutting edge best practices to help their children when they're home and how do you discuss items, even if you don't know the, 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 the new approach to standards and mathematics as a parent, there are key questions that you can ask children to determine that they are moving forward. So that's the benefit of those compacts. And um, what gets monitored gets done. So if we're able to do that and have that type of dialogue, it requires that we develop lists of parents that are a part of our school and we can reach out to them frequently to have them involved and engaged in, in the process. So, more engagement, a heavier presence of the adults to support the school, also sending, sending the messages to our community and to our parents that we value them. And uh, that's the accountability piece for that. OK. Next question. What are you doing to increase the capacity of teachers to do their very important work? To, to increase the capacity of teachers to do their work? Yes, what are you doing to increase the capacity of okay. teachers to, to do their very important work? Professional learning is the key. Earlier I mentioned the whole notion of not just being highly qualified, but highly effective. 
the whole notion of training our leaders at the central level, at the building level, to then support teachers to be able to measure learning on a day-to-day -day basis, closely aligned to the elements of the standard. In other words, the information that should be taught and having the alignment between the taught curriculum and the tested curriculum. It's our responsibility to ensure that we all know how to do that work and prov providing the necessary tools to measure the outcomes from a formative standpoint and have the snapshots early enough to know that children are struggling. And when we know early enough, then we can address it. And to know that children are excelling. And when we know that early enough, then we can address it. So professional development and professional learning must continue to become more robust and aligned to those fundamental needs. Okay, and one last question. Um, how is the school division engaging the community in its new initiatives? Well, I talked a lot about the strategic plan and the fact that we utilize a planning team. I didn't mention, I don't believe that, across those five strategies that the planning team developed, I did mention that there were multiple action plans, but there were also multiple action teams. I think we had about 500 people that were involved in that process. So last year, we had pretty good involvement across the community. That involvement must continue, and I think prime examples of that is that through the recommendation of, if we use the transformation initiative as an example, and it is a recommendation, it is not something that is, has come to fruition. However, we've had multiple community conversations around that, and we will continue to engage the community around that. We are going to have, I think, at least four different committees that I mentioned earlier that will talk about what a management team should look like if we head in this direction. We will have a calendar committee. People have volunteered to look at what does it mean to change the calendar so that children will have more time leading up to the summer. To also, what does a modified lottery mean? If we're going to open up seats and open up choice so that we incrementally begin to build choice because ultimately we want every parent and every child in Norfolk to take a look at offerings and choose and not be bound by their neighborhood or their zip code. And so have those focus groups enter into those discussions. We also have the young Richter in place taking a look at all of our structures. And we've had multiple discussions in the last one that I attended was Lake Taylor High School, and we had a couple of hundred people present. Very good discussion, good round tables about school capacity. What are the changes that are necessary? What are the implications around building new schools? What are the implications around the fact that we've not changed zones in, what I'm, in, in 30 years, I'm told? And so what should be happening with those kinds of things? So that will continue. That is a requirement because it is a part of the strategic plan. If we're going to stay true to it, then the community can hold us responsible for it. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. King. That's all the time we have for you. Thank you.